Ready to go, Greg? Okay, you're going to start with the, to the camera and address to the camera? Yep, looking at it right there, I think. All right. Okay. Hello once again from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown. I'm Dennis Webster from radio station WJTN, and I'm joined by Greg Peterson. He is a partner in the Phillips Lytle Law Firm, working in the Jamestown office, and one of the founders of this center. We are here for the second in a series of interviews on his work to establish and build this institution dedicated to the life and work of Robert H. Jackson. Greg, thank you for speaking with me again today. Delighted to, Dennis. In the first of these interviews, Greg spoke of the inspiration he received from the address delivered by Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor near Love School in Jamestown in 1996 at the dedication of the Robert H. Jackson statue there at that time. And Greg talked of his surprise when the prominent Jamestown industrialist Carl Kappa told him Jackson was his hero over a period of just a few years under Greg's leadership. This center was born, this building acquired, and programming was begun. And that is where we begin today. Greg, it is a fascinating story of the people that you attracted to this institution and continue to do so. And in mulling over the names that we could talk about in this second session today, one that seemed to come to the top of the list every time I tossed the cards was John Q. Barrett, the Elizabeth Lene Fellow here at the Robert H. Jackson Center, someone who's also very closely associated with this institution today. How did that association begin? I received a call one day from a professor, John Q. Barrett, and I had no knowledge of him or his interest, and he introduced himself by saying that he was a professor of law at St. John's University School of Law and was interested in advancing some biographical information on Robert Jackson. And as part of his early research, he had reached out to Harold Adams, Harold Adams from Frewsburg, Harold Adams, the nephew of Robert Jackson. And Harold said, you know, if you want to, feel free to reach out to Greg Peterson, who is contemplating starting the Jackson Center. I think we mentioned last session that uh, in February of 2001, Ed Tomasini, who was off camera, and myself really filmed the first time a discussion regarding the Jackson legacy that Harold gave and kind of spilled the beans that there might be a Jackson Center. Harold picked up on it also, told John, and John called me. Now, John was trying to convince me that he was a bona fides and that he was in the process of uh, drafting a book called That Man based on the uh, autobiographical information that Robert Jackson had started but never finished. And it found its way into his son, William Jackson, and John had created a relationship with William Jackson. William died. At the funeral, John, who paid his respects, was then advised by uh, William Jackson's son-in-law that there was this unfinished draft on Franklin Roosevelt. Would he like to see it? <laughs> Well, John, like a kid in a candy store saying, you get what, a Jackson handwritten draft that's not been published? So he was starting to work on that and actually sent it to me in draft form, still have it, to convince me that he was legitimate. Now, we were hardly convincing anybody that we were <laughs> legitimate. So we kept in touch, and I told him that we were going to have our first big event May 1st, 2001, Law Day. And John said, I got to be there. My interest is Jackson. The Jackson Center is formally being uh, revealed. The family members and community will be out in force. I would just like to be in the crowd. And he was just in the crowd. He was not a speaker. He was just an attendee. What I hear you saying to me is that you and John Q. Barrett were sort of on parallel tracks, kind of at the same time, in terms of your growing curiosity about uh, Robert H. Jackson, growing interest. You here, him there, uh, I presume he was uh, already working or teaching in uh, New York City at that time. Correct. And um, you just happened to come across each other as a result of his initial outreach to Harold Adams. 
Absolutely correct. It grew from there, though. It grew immensely from there. Um, there's a picture which I, 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 I relish because there is, in May 1st, our speaker was Eugene Gerhardt, the biographer of Robert Jackson, who'd written the book <coughs> about Justice Jackson, of John getting, John getting Gene Gerhardt's autograph on Gerhardt's book. Sort of the passing of the torch, if you will, an 80-year-old biographer of a book of 1958, and John, who then was picking up the torch to then write a book which is somewhat autobiographical on that man about Roosevelt, but lots has Jackson's through Jackson's lenses. And then, of course, John, since then, has become the Elizabeth S. Linnae scholar and been intimately involved. Now, I can't let 2001, which is where we are kind of in that first year, without this vignette. Okay. Um, as we know, Dan Bratton, uh, Chautauqua Institution president, retires December 31st, 2000. Then because of a serendipitous meeting and gathering with Betty and Carl here at the Kappa Theater, uh, he says, I'm going to be your executive director. He appointed himself. He appointed himself. And we said, yes, of course. Uh, he then dies. But that created a connection with Chautauqua also created a connection with some of the locals who were involved in the foundations, and one of them was Dr. Lillian Ney. Dr. Lillian Ney, uh, a trustee at Chautauqua, and also a trustee of the Gebby Foundation, mm -hmm. also an original uh, investor here, to the tune of a half a million dollars. And so she, through her connections at Chautauqua, uh, convinced Chautauqua to invite me to be a speaker at the Hall of Philosophy on the newly formed Robert H. Jackson Center and to give a speech about Justice Jackson and his legacy. Now, I gotta tell you, uh, as we talked a little bit off camera, I didn't know much of anything about the biography of Jackson when we started this other than a desire to learn. And to your intimidation factor of uh, being thrown in front of the Hall of Philosophy uh, pretending to be a scholar when, in fact, half of the Chautauquans are much more knowledgeable. So uh, she invited me. I accepted, and I said, boy, I need help. So I reached out to an attorney in Cortland, New York, named Ted Fenstermacher, who was a Nuremberg prosecutor. He agreed to come to be the real deal. Mm. I would be speaking. He's the guy. Now, he's going to cover me. I can give 10 minutes. He can do the hour. A week before, he calls me, he says, I'm in the hospital, I, I'm not gonna be able to make it. Yikes, I'm, I'm really naked. So I reach out to John, who I'd met, and we kept casually in touch after May 1st, to say, John, can you carry the day? And he did. So that was his first introduction to Chautauqua. That was his first speech at Chautauqua, it was in July of 2001 bailing me out, bailing the Jackson Center from falling flat on its face, and again, the rest is history. It would be interesting, and uh, this is really a question for John Q. Barrett, but it's obvious at this point, we've learned through the first interview that you and I did in this series what fueled your interest in Robert H. Jackson. Do you know what fueled his? Um, there is on YouTube, we have a YouTube site at the Robert H. Jackson, a 2001 interview with John, and he talks about that. Uh, and essentially, he, scholarship-wise, he kept running into him in his constitutional law world. He also knew there had been no, other than Gerhardt, uh, any critical analysis of Jackson, any, any other biographical work certainly no autobiographical work. And so he felt like he, that was a niche that he could grab onto. Everybody in that world of scholarship wants to find a niche with a goal to become the expert. Hmm. So that was his identification of Jackson. Certainly impressed, but he knew there was something marketable here. Uh, and so that was John's 
keen scholarship interest, yes, it was, and which then became, became his passion. Uh, and he's annually, since 2001, has spoken at Chautauqua. The uh, book, That Man, is right out in the book rack here at the Robert H. Jackson Center and is widely available. And uh, John's blog on Jackson with events and pictures and so much information about his personal life and his professional life as he grew through his many jobs of, and all the way to being a Nurem the chief Nuremberg prosecutor uh, is really quite an exceptional body of work on its own. And most people who would ever see this would probably know that already, but if not, you should uh, look into that. I want to leave John Barrett for a moment and go back to something that you, a point you made with me as we concluded our conversation in the first hour of this series of interviews, Greg. As the center came to life quite quickly, you were um, driven to do a couple of things. One was to make sure that the Jackson Center continued to be publicized, continued to get space on the front page, uh, if you will. I think last time I said uh, on the marquee. And at the same time, you created an institution that uh, had no archive at all. So you were simultaneously very interested in developing a body of information, of knowledge, artifacts that could uh, celebrate uh, and honor the legacy of Robert H. Jackson. Tell me how Michael Berenbaum fit into that plan early on. Again, serendipity. Michael Berenbaum uh, was credited with being the inspiration and the sweat behind the creation of the Holocaust Museum. So he was a speaker at Chautauqua, 2001, and a friend of mine through other passion I have is baseball, uh, wanted me to meet Michael Berenbaum so we could talk about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Mm. And so we went and had lunch. Next thing you know, we talked about it at a very busy and loud restaurant in Mayville. Uh, but, but I asked him about what did the Holocaust Museum and his studies and his, about, what's Jackson mean? Well, he immediately was incredibly articulate. Hmm. So much so, I, my camcorder wasn't working fast enough and I couldn't get his story. So I invited him here. So he agreed on, on a, two days later to come to this theater and he sat down and I invited Raleigh Kidder, I invited our board members, uh, to just sort of have a semicircle around Michael after I gave him a quick tour saying, here's where we are. And Raleigh was executive director at that time? Raleigh was not, but he was on the board. Okay. And we did not have an executive director. So we sat around uh, and asked Michael, if you were to start this from, you know, it's a whiteboard, what would you do? And he then me proceeded to rip off 15 points what he knew about Jackson, which was immense. Solicitor General, Attorney General, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, things that he had accomplished in all of those fields. Nuremberg, of course, which was near and dear to Michael. And here are some things you ought to do uh, audio-visually, do some interviews, uh, and educate people so they appreciate that what this man accomplished. And building-wise, here are some things I would do. Here are some people I would invite. And I, I videotaped that interview, since he also was involved in interviewing through Steven Spielberg, uh, thousands of Holocaust survivors. That was part of Michael's project. And so we interviewed it, and it was fabulous. Um, we, we transcribed it. And three years later, he came back to Chautauqua, invited him back down here to report to him. Mike, here was, you might not remember this because there was no notes. It was off the top of his head, bada bing. And I said, let me just say we've checkmarked 13 of your 15. Uh, and just to draw complete closure to the Michael Berenbaum story, uh, a few years ago, the Jackson Center was honored uh, by the March of the Living, which is an umbrella group for um, various Jewish foundations. And we received a Shoah Award, and we were given that in Krakow. Uh, and so there I gave a speech in front of many, many, many people. But in the front row was Michael Berenbaum. Huh. And so I had to call out that uh, Michael Berenbaum right there, head of the Holocaust Museum, why he's invited to this event here in 2017, 
was so instrumental for us as he gave us some structure. Um, so I'll always be indebted to Michael Barabon, but again, a piece of serendipity through Chautauqua, through baseball actually, and here we are. What were some of the things that he suggested that you do with the center in terms of its programming and its development, Greg? He's, programmatically, he felt that it's critical that if you can find and interview those people who knew him. Now, that fed into my wheelhouse anyways, but to hear it, he goes, Go out, find them. If they can't come here, go there. Just get them on, get them on tape. <clears throat> and so we did that. Uh, bring people here. Uh, describe what a solicitor general does. Maybe through a solicitor general, former solicitor general. Describe what an attorney general does through a former attorney general. Be sure you invite Chief Justice Rehnquist, because he was a law clerk. You know, all those things which might seem obvious, but it just kind of flowed from Michael, and hearing it reaffirmed some of our interests, but also added so much more. Uh, and then he talked about the structure, he talked about funding, talked about relationships with various foundations, uh, and getting involved with collaborations with, uh, with, with particular colleges and law schools, and Nuremberg which all of that happened. Well, and it's interesting to hear you talk about how he developed the Holocaust Museum and uh, really planted the seed with you, several of them, in terms of reaching out to mm -hmm. uh, those that you could find who knew Jackson or worked with Jackson, which you have uh, done extremely well with here, and in, particularly in the early years when many of them were still on this earth and available to speak to you and uh, also some of the other ideas that he brought to you about um, cultivating community interest uh, in the center and always reaching out to people is something that goes on to this day. And the seed about Rehnquist is the other one that I'll pick up in a few minutes if occasion presents in this hour, uh, Greg Peterson. But one of the other things that you said early on to us was that uh, you had certainly gathered a lot of local support, Betty Lanay, Carl Kappa, Chautauqua Region Community Foundation and um, the Gebby Foundation, uh, Dr. Ney, you mentioned uh, in this interview today. But the ongoing need for support must have had you also reaching out to other people to find ways to continue to have, to get them to endorse the work and then endorse the check, if you want me to say sure. it that way. So who were among those that helped in those earliest years pick up that part of this? Well, certainly we knew we, uh, we had a good start, thank God, for Gabby, Carl, and Betty. So we had some monies to get through the early years. Uh, we knew we had capital concerns uh, in the building. And so when Raleigh Kidder came on board as our permanent executive uh, in November of 2001, he had connections through the legislature and his relationships in Albany, and that was very helpful, specifically Pat McGee, uh, then thereafter Kathy Young, uh, uh, Bill, William Parment, uh, Brian Higgins when he was our congressman, uh, Amo Holden, Jack when they all participated. So that whole was the, from the Capitol, that was incredibly helpful. From the local foundations, it was frankly beating the drum a lot uh, by having events here, mm -hmm. events at the Jackson Center, then then known as the Kappa Theater, I felt it was very critical to have at least once a month something which probably had a notable from the outside the area to talk about Jackson. Because we as a community knew very little about him. You know, there wasn't any misinformation, there just wasn't information. So it was important for us to have that, and with that, you know, became built up a body of community interest, and with that interest came support. Now, um, it just impresses me, a program a month, it's pretty ambitious for a young center like this. I probably should have phrased my statement off the cuff a little better in saying that they would endorse the work and you could endorse the check, but tell me about the Hagans. Yeah, Tom and Susie Hagan, again, a piece of serendipity, Susie Hagan, uh, and Tom were uh, major philanthropists. They were the uh, 
uh, owners behind Erie Insurance, very much involved in Chautauqua Institution. My wife, Cindy, and Susie were both on the board of Chautauqua during the nascent years of the Jackson Center. Uh, we had them down for dinner one night, but I brought them in for dinner early to come here, to show them this, and took the quick tour for Tom and, and Susie Hagen. And I sat them down, and they wanted, of course, then immediately grill me about what the vision was. And it wasn't so much what I said, it's what they said. And they said they've been involved in lots of successes and not successful not-for-profits. And they were very mindful that, Greg, you've got to kind of narrow in on two or three areas of the Jackson story and stay with it. That's going to be harder, easier said than done, but stay with it. Because when you have a center which is the Justice Jackson, Justice Robert Jackson, social justice, you will be asked to lend your name to a, a myriad of social justice concerns, all of which are valid. But if you spread yourself too thin, you'll never have a core mission and a core success. And that advice, that advice has driven us for the last 20 years. Did it alter your plans or your trajectory at that moment? Uh, tell me how important that change was at that time. It, it, it was. We were getting, because uh, we had a theater, and as I mentioned, uh, an event a month, if you will, and we were having events probably seemingly every week, and lots of community people would want to now they see this theater. This theater's been around for the 1920s but hasn't been used, and frankly, in mothballs. But now that it's alive, and all of a sudden people want to come, uh, social groups, uh, and just use it, and they wanted the Jackson name to go with it. Uh, we didn't know where the bright line was, where we should participate and not, so we were learning, learning. And it was really Tom and Susie at that moment, and they were very pointed about it, said, you know, find, find that. And you know, I went back to the board meeting the next time we met. There. I said, you know, here's the Hagans who are incredibly successful and supportive. Uh, here's what they said. So we kind of worked our way towards really three legs to a, the stool of Jackson. Uh, one, the Jackson biography. You know, his, his time as in Jamestown. What, what, what is this story of a guy who never went to college, never graduated from law school? What is distinctive about that that might be a lesson to be learned? You know, what happened in Spring Creek, Frewsburg, Jamestown, practice of law. The next is his public career, which is the attorney general, solicitor general, and I trust division. Supreme Court Justice, what was that all about? And the third is really his impact on international criminal law, Nuremberg, and that legacy. And I think if you look at what we programmed, and there's hundreds, maybe thousands, programs we've had over the last 20 years, you could categorize virtually everything into those three buckets. And what's happened, because of the Hagans, and I, and I, I tell Tom this, uh, we, we've identified this through these three, and when there are anniversaries of one, anniversary of his birthday, you put a Klieg light on that. If it's an anniversary of Nuremberg, which we're now living through, now, boom, Klieg light on that. Last couple of years, we had Korematsu, Barnett, 75th anniversaries of those big cases, Klieg lights. <coughs> so we, it's permitted us to be diverse, but focused. There was the possibility then that uh, this center could become so diluted in terms of things that you wanted to focus on or causes that were waved at you or, or offered to you, 
that uh, it could have been um, less strong, less effective than you think it's been now over the 20 years? Absolutely. So I, 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 I attribute that to, to Hagen's really sort of don't let, don't let and, and there's been many, a myriad of opportunities of which we have uh, been presented and I, some of which we've tangentially done, but we always kept those core th three values in mind. Some of the people who have come here, and you tipped your hand a little bit to me and I've done some of my own research, but I just want to name some names here. Uh, from that era, we're still talking about the earliest year or years of the Robert H. Jackson Center. Let me just say these names to you and see what you say back to me, to us, about who they were and how they influenced your programs here at the Jackson Center. And the first one, and help me say this, John Dalloboy. John Dalloboy. John uh, wrote a book called The Circle of Friends. John was a uh, former ambassador to Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. John I, I got act I was given the book at Chautauqua by a friend in 2001, read it, and I said, my gosh, this guy's a Nuremberg guy. And so I reached out to John, he lived in Ohio, uh, to see if he might come, and he became our second speaker. He came here early September, and I set the scene, it was a rotary event. Hmm. You know, kind of a noon rotary on a Monday. This place is packed. Now normally, and no disrespect to rotary, after about 20 minutes, they lose interest and leave. Or get fidgety. Hard to keep attention because they got a lot of things going on and go back to work. These are professionals and they're taking their noon hour exactly. for the club. And so that's normal. Well, John spoke about his experiences as an interpreter at the, uh, it's called the Ashcan, where all of the Nazi Third Reich leaders were placed when they were arrested. They went to Luxembourg, they went to a hotel. And that's where they were encamped. They didn't immediately go to Nuremberg, that's where they were. So John pretended he was a Red Cross worker and worked among the Gehrings, the Ribbentrops, the Keitels, the Yodels, all these guys that are became household names, or at least Nuremberg names later. He's there in the room where it happened, if I could use a Hamilton speech. And so he's gathering information. Surreptitiously. Yeah, because they think he's a Red Cross guy, and so they figure he, he can help them. Gehring's opening up, bleh, saying how bad the military people were. The military people, Yodel, Keitel, bleh, the politicians, Gehring, those Raventrop. So he's getting all this information and reporting it every night, ultimately back to... The internal Nazi intrigue. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so, and he was a great storyteller. So I'm telling you, they, he went for about an hour and 15 minutes at this Rotary event. I'll never forget this. I've talked about it several times. Not a pin dropped. He had him. He had him. And John, we then used that speech in a subsequent interview. He, Ed, Ed will tell you, we interviewed him for like two hours after he gave the speech. We posted that on YouTube, and that became a real beginning part of our education of Nuremberg who the people were, because there has been, still is to this day in 2021, a intrigue in who the Nazis hierarchy were. What made them tick? Who was Hitler? Who was Goering? Who was Hess? Who were these guys? And we have, we were blessed to have many of them who actually, like you and I, met them and could give firsthand knowledge. So John was the first and we had subsequent, but I, uh, John, we kept in touch. He subsequently came to Chautauqua many times, gave speeches, packed houses at the Hall of Philosophy, and uh, just a real good friend. But that was, again, serendipity. Somebody handed me a book. I read the book. I followed up. Next thing you know, he's here. Marty Coyle. Marty Coyle, a good friend. He's a, he was a lawyer, general counsel for uh, um, TRW in Cleveland, board member at Chautauqua, and through Cindy, relationship with, who was on the board of Chautauqua, uh, serendipity. Um, 
he was here without his wife for a, a weekend. We took him out to dinner at Miller's Grove. Uh -huh. Give him a plug. And I'm, he's Fruisburg. Telling, yeah, Fruisburg. And I'm plugging, he's telling, what's new, Greg? And I'm telling him about this Jackson Center. It had to be three months old. He goes, what are you going to be doing? Uh, well, we're going to try to focus in on Jackson's Nuremberg career, et cetera. He goes, well, one of my associates counsel in the general counsel's office at TRW in Cleveland is Henry King. Henry King, who was an associate counsel at the Nuremberg trial. He goes, Greg, if you want to have, get a hold of Henry, I'll make it happen. And I said, of course, why not? So that night, he gets home. I bought his dinner. Uh, Thank thanks, you. thanks, <laughs> thanks. And they said, here's Henry's contact. So I called him immediately, told him what I'd like to do, dream is to have a Nuremberg prosecutor's reunion. Is there anybody? Who is there? So I didn't know. And he goes, well, you got to have Whitney Harris. Whitney Harris was Jackson's number two at the Nuremberg trial, but he's still alive and in St. Louis, and here's his number. And so I called Whitney, who was very gracious, and he said, yeah, if you're going to pull the gang together, I'll come. But if you have this, you can't have it without Bernie Meltzer in Chicago, who was a University of Chicago dean, law professor, dean and law professor. And uh, so I got a hold of Bernie. And so Whitney, Henry, we set a date in October of 20, or 2001. They all agreed to come, as did now, then a fourth person named James Conway. And we had a C-SPAN moment here at the center, places packed. We had an introduction here, and then we went behind closed doors, it created a studio where our, now our boardroom is. And John Barrett interviewed those guys, and that was our first super event, which got C-SPAN coverage. And this is all the first year, really as a result of Marty Coyle mentioning a name. Now, Greg, help us with some time perspectives here for a moment. The anniversary, as we record in 2021, of Nuremberg is being celebrated now. How many years ago was that? 75 years ago. 75 years ago. And now, it's, if we run back the clock 20 years from now, 55 years after Nuremberg, there are still these people available. And it sounds as though, from the tone that you're using here, that the kind of events that you created, that uh, colossal event, was just something that had not happened before or had not happened a long time in the 55 years since Nuremberg? It, it, uh, I'll drop another name here, uh, Drexel Sprecher. Drexel Sprecher uh, was also a prosecutor alive at the time, and um, we knew of him, but we didn't know where to get a hold of him, can candidly. But we knew that he had had a couple of Nuremberg reunions back in the 90s. Mm. So, we're, no, we're not the first, but probably the last. Uh, and based on that inspiration, we got a hold of those that were alive then and uh, showed up at Drexel. Uh, uh, maybe I'll just talk about it briefly. I did go down to Washington after our event here and interviewed him. He gave me his book, which he had just finished on the Nuremberg trial, which was, it's encyclopedic. And he also gave me, and most importantly, his address list for the people that he and his wife had invited to the 1992 and 90, 92, uh, and 96 reunion. They hadn't had any since and would not have any more. But magic, magic, because now here's the names, the phone numbers, and addresses of the, that alumni group of Nuremberg people who subsequently became the source material for people I invited to come here. The other time perspective on this, and I'm sure that the viewers are thinking about this as well, uh, Greg, is that uh, how serendipitous, fortuitous, that all of this came together at this point, Absolutely. because we're 55 years post Nuremberg. These people may have been in their 20s, probably more likely 30s or 40s, uh, approaching that age at that time, I would suspect maybe that some that you would love to have been able to speak to were no longer with us on this earth. But timing, as they say, is everything. 
and you really captured them, um, their impressions of Nuremberg and more, which we'll get into in a second here, um, at, at, in a most appropriate and timely fashion before all those memories and thoughts were lost. No question. I think it's fair to say that when we started this in late December of 2000, if you'd asked who might you bring here as a guest, I have no idea. I didn't know if anybody was alive who had interfaced with Jackson, certainly in Nuremberg, because Nuremberg was 1945, 46. Uh, and I'm gonna do a little shout out to another person, uh, Joe Persico, who we mentioned, but his book on Nuremberg, mm -hmm. which was put out in 1996, again, given to me in late 90s uh, at Chautauqua, and I just skimmed it. But within it had uh, an acknowledgement page, which I went back and looked at after we got started. And there was a number of interviews that Joe Persico had done thanking the following people. Now that told me, at least in 1996, they were probably alive. Now maybe they're still alive in 2000 or 2001. So I started going through white pages up at the Prendergast, uh, tracking people down. And that led to a series of number of people who were program guests here, or if they were unable to travel, I would get in the car and go see them and interview. There are more people and we can get to some of them in just a second. But at this juncture, though, I need to come back to um, you and your impressions of the life and work of Robert H. Jackson. In our first interview, the first hour, you said that you had uh, kind of a nodding acquaintance with his legacy as a member of the Jamestown Bar Association, and you were a member of the Jamestown Bar Association some years after. You were motivated by Sandra Day O'Connor's remarks when the Jackson statue was dedicated at Jackson Square near Love School. But you started with a very limited amount of knowledge. Suddenly, your knowledge bank about Robert H. Jackson is exploding. What from um, King or Harris or Sprecher or uh, others of that time that you've mentioned amplified or made better for you, clarified your understanding of Jackson and his work? I think one of the early walkaways, and this may have come as early as 1996, when there was a dinner after the dedication of the statue at Moonbrook, of which uh, William Jackson, Robert Jackson's son, who was at Nuremberg, with his dad, spoke. Spoke emotionally, because I don't think, he was taken by the whole day. Mm -hmm. And he talked about his dad being um, a person of Jamestown jurisprudence. And that was a phrase used by another justice. And how Nuremberg impacted him and how he used a lot of his uh, pragmatic approaches towards just managing people, managing this massive trial, and learning more about him, a complex, complex person, but nevertheless one who still maintained his roots, a country lawyer. And that's a phrase used by many. And I wanted to learn more about what that meant, country lawyer, which then led to people asking lots of questions. Um, what do you do in Jamestown? Did he pass the, how, pass the bar, you know, and all that stuff, the early stage possible? Uh, where did he practice? Who did he practice with? So now it's a, it's a dig in the directory and a dig asking some old people about him, all of which enhanced my own knowledge of what it was like to practice. He, his practice was like in Jamestown. And it's a whole story unto itself. Uh, but then, uh, being asked, frankly, in a community, and we live in a community with lots of fraternal organizations, and they're always looking for speakers. Well, I'm, I'm a young kid, and I'm fair game, new project, and I was giving talks all the time. Well, all of a sudden, if you're giving talks, you better kind of know what you're talking about. 
which it then in and of itself is an educational process. Uh, and started giving law day talks in schools and a lot of opportunities. So it's changed me immediately because I had to learn. If you're going to be out front on a center named after Robert Jackson and with the modest knowledge that you mentioned earlier, I better learn something fairly quickly. So I was asking lots of questions. And through the courses of the interviews I was doing with individuals, asking what made Jackson tick. And all of them had various many different perspectives, but it was an opportunity. One person who was very helpful to me, uh, we have not mentioned him yet, is George Kneebank. Mm -hmm. George Kneebank uh, was a clerk, was a law clerk of Jackson's. And his story is one of it being a Jamestown guy. His dad was a banker. Here? And dad was a banker here named George Kneebank Sr. And George Kneebank Sr. had, uh, it was the, um, I'm going to get this probably wrong, First National Bank, and he was a big time officer. Jackson was the attorney for First National Bank. Mm. And so they had a close relationship. And in fact, so much so that when Jackson went to Washington, Jackson's house, which is on Fairmont Avenue, now Allegheny Assets, if you drive by, uh, he, they leased it, didn't sell it, but they leased it to George Niebank. So George Niebank Sr. and the family lived in the Jackson house. Hmm. Fast forward, uh, in 1951, when George Niebank Jr. graduated, he was looking for a job and reached out to his dad's close friend, landlord, <laughs> Robert Jackson, and... Knee Bank became a law clerk. Um, having known that, but before we started the Jackson Center in 2000, this is, make it a little confusing to the listener, but I was interested in things Jackson, but not Jackson Center in the year 2000, and are doing a lot of interviews. And George Knee Bank was in town. And I invited him to be our Jamestown Bar Association Centennial Dinner Speaker. Mm -hmm which was 2000, before the Jackson Center started. And so he agreed. So he came here. And of course now, a lot of pomp, circumstances, there's pictures of seemingly hundreds of lawyers from all over the place, all at Anthony Motel, engineer George Niebank speaking. But of course I got an interview, which I do. And from that, I learned a lot about the person, about the person. And so George became very in, uh, important as a background source. And also, he subsequently came back a couple other times when we had clerk gatherings. But also, we're going to now probably uh, uh, segue a little bit that his co law clerk, uh, when, when he was there with Jackson, was a guy named William Rehnquist. Mm. He said, Maybe you should reach out to Bill. Oh, okay. You know, like I can just pick up the phone and call Bill Rehnquist. He was the Chief, Chief Justice, Justice of the time. United States. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for the speakers, or for the, for the audience, his title is Chief Justice of the United States. Like President of the United States, not Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. So he's the top of the judiciary in the United States. Anyways, uh, probably a story to be told a little bit later. I'm not sure, Dennis, your timing, but... Uh, we should probably leave him for maybe we'll a We'll get to that, but that was a seed planted. We'll leave it for that for George and Ebank. Well, and, and I have a list here. There are 11 that I know of law clerks for Robert H. Jackson during his time at the Supreme Court. And George Nebank did graduate UB 1950 and served for two years. Most interesting that uh, Jackson would um, favor that relationship and um, give an extraordinary 11 clerks over this uh, and some Supreme Court justices, uh, if they serve longer, have many, many more than 11 clerks, but it is a very highly sought after position. And you might say in a sentence or two what the clerk's role is because it's very important to the justices. Well, they uh, often 
review petitions for certiorari. One of the part of the process is anybody can petition to have their case heard before the Supreme Court. There are some jurisdictional things, but also individuals can, and somebody's got to wade through all that. So clerks wade through the whole that for the benefit of the judges, who then decide whether or not to grant certiorari, which permits a person to argue before the court. Uh, they're also uh, a, a right, a do a lot of research. They also occasionally will assist in uh, writing opinions. Jackson was one of the rare ones who actually wrote most of his own. So clerks are very active in that way, and it's a very uh, high-pressured, uh, usually two-year uh, term period uh, to, to do that. So that's, and as you mentioned, Jackson had 11 of them in total. That's the pool. And we, over a short period of time, contacted and got a hold of and got involved eight of them. Plum job might be too crass a way to put it, but it's certainly very much sought after by people who want to uh, become judges themselves, uh, make a mark in the world, to have uh, clerked for a Supreme Court justice on your resume is a very rare and special thing. And I should point out a little bit about Jackson's personality. Thank you. Uh, along those lines, because when he was in the process of choosing people, in today's world, you almost got to be Harvard, Yale, Chicago, or Stanford. If you not, don't have that resume, forget it. You're not likely to be a clerk. That's just how the current world works. Well, Jackson wasn't so caught up in that. I mean, he had George Niebank. Uh, uh, there was a little bit of a, a relationship, but also University of Buffalo, guys from Temple. Some of the lesser known law schools became the sources of his law clerks. Uh, so it wasn't an automatic Ivy League school jump to the Supreme Court. Jackson was looking at the personality and uh, was looking something deeper than just the resume. So what did Niebank reveal to you, enlighten you uh, to about the character of Robert H. Jackson behind closed doors? Yeah, one, he was open, he was transparent, not every judge was. Uh, he encouraged input from the clerks. Um, he um, often had them write sort of position papers, uh, trial briefs, or bench briefs is what they were called. And he would take them to heart, mark them up, and, he, and then he would, and also at the same time, have his clerks mark them up. Hmm. Uh, and Jackson took an interest in the personalities, the persons outside the courtroom. You know, how's home? How's your wife? How are the kids? And would write little notes to the parents. Uh, you know, it was just, uh, uh, he never uh, stood on a pedestal. He never took his position as only one of nine justices of the United States. Uh, to, to, to be haughty or anything like that. This was a, um, had, had a real down-home personality, and that's part of that country lawyer background. Well, and this, uh, and you phrased it, Jamestown jurisprudence is something that I would like to catch up with thematically again in maybe a subsequent uh, session here, because uh, the idea of some things that you could learn practicing law in the city of Jamestown uh, for a couple of decades before being um, moved up into some prestigious positions in Washington and how that could affect you as a, a solicitor general or an attorney general or a Supreme Court justice or a prosecutor at uh, the Nuremberg war crimes trials I think would be an interesting theme to follow but in the time that remains in this hour before we get to uh, Justice Rehnquist and some of the other people who celebrated people who have been a part of this place uh, it would seem important at this point to talk about Father Fuchs, yeah. and his relationship with Robert H. Jackson, and how important he was to the development of this center in the early days. Father Fuchs, I read about him initially in Joe Persico's book. Uh, he <clears throat> was a private who uh, survived the uh, Battle of the Bulge, the Hurtgen Forest specifically. He was shot, wounded went back to his uh, division, ended up at Nuremberg uh, in, during the occupation. And though he's not quite sure how this happened, he was individually and exclusively selected uh, by his commanding officer at the request of the Nuremberg security staff to be Robert Jackson's bodyguard. He had one. Hmm. Today, think of the Social Secret Service, you think massives of number of people. 
He was one, and he lived with him. So that's in the book. And you read a little bit about this, and this was a result of an interview that Joe Persico did with Father Fuchs. So I'm reading this. I go, wow. I wonder if he's still alive. How do I get a hold of him? I don't know. So I, uh, uh, in the book, just talks about upstate New York. So you're kind of flailing. So I found Syracuse, and I called a directory assistant, and they said, we're looking for Moritz Fuchs. They said, well, we have a number in Fulton, New York. I'll take it. So I called, and on the other end of the line uh, says, hello, Father Fuchs. Very, very monotone. Hello, Father Fuchs. I said, hello, this is Greg Peterson. Yes. And I wonder if I could spend a few minutes with you. And he goes, well, uh, I've got to go and meet with the uh, sisters at the altar society, rosary society. I, I butchered that. Sorry, Catholics. I butchered it. Um, Altar and Rosary Society. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I've got to go meet with them, so I, I really don't have time. I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry." And uh, he goes, "What's your name again?" He goes, "My name's Greg Peterson." And who are you? Well, I'm an attorney in Jamestown. Why are you called? Oh, monotone. And I said, "Well, I'm one of the founders of the Robert H. Jackson Center, and I wondered if you're the same Fuchs that was part of him." Yes, I was. All of a sudden, pew, he exploded. <laughs> And I said, I just, I, I know we'll talk another time, but, because uh, you have to go, but I wondered, uh, you know, how did this happen? I mean, how did, just out of curiosity, I know you got to go, but if you have a two-minute answer, he goes, he goes, then he started, he just lit right up. <laughs> he just went from monotone to an engaged, uh, dynamic personality, and essentially said, 20 minutes later, he's still rolling. <laughs> I said, Father, Father, you, you, I know you had to go to the society here. He goes, ah, the ladies can wait. It's okay. <laughs> we'll talk. So I'd hit a nerve. And so obviously I had now the bodyguard. As close as you're going to find to Robert Jackson's activities at Nuremberg. Because Father Fuchs, Moritz Fuchs, private Moritz Fuchs, uh, was with him 24-7. I mean, this is the gold mine. So this was early 20, 2002. So the next week, I get in a car, and in a snowstorm, drive to Fulton, New York, which is north of Syracuse. Right. Go to his house, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to film this guy. And we do. And the next thing you know, uh, I said, Could you, would you be willing to come here when the weather breaks? He agreed. And I said, do, do you, have you ever given a homily, you know, about Nuremberg since you subsequently came back and became a priest, which is a whole another hour-long story. Right. Um, he goes, no, never have. I've just, my goal is to save lives, teach the word of Christ, uh, and I really I never do that. Would you? Well, I'd love to. I've never been asked, and nor have I had a chance to, but I'll prepare something. So he came here. Place is packed. Mm -hmm. Catholic priests were here. You know, everybody in the world, Jim Roselli was set up to, you know, co-interview with him, Jim and I. And it was magic. It was magic. And subsequently, he enjoyed it so much that we stayed in touch. He came back for every one of our big events. He became the priest uh, of the Jackson Center. So whether it's Rehnquist, Roberts, we had invocations, benedictions, anything big, the movie premieres, Fuchs was here. And of course he lent credibility because if you're trying to get into the personality of Jackson, he's it. Nobody got closer. What did he teach you about the character and the work of the character of Robert H. Jackson and his work at Nuremberg? Is even temperedness, because uh, there were so many conflicting stakeholders of trying to get the attention of the, of the what the prosecution would look like, uh, the number of attorneys, all ego, all all have egos. Uh, not, shocking anybody here, and they all want attention, and this was a huge endeavor, and Jackson was the quarterback. 
He's the guy that was the architect of the Nuremberg trial. So not only did he have to put the trial together, negotiate the indictment, London agreement, the treaty among all the allies, and then put together a trial team, assemble all the evidence, get all of the attorneys involved, you know, and, and at various times cross-examine some of the major witnesses. I mean, this is a tremendous one-man show, which could have been incredibly taxing and tiring, but somehow he was able to keep an even keel through it all. And that sense of humility really had an impact on, on Fuchs. Um, and he, he conveyed that on, on his many speeches, but certainly in the initial interviews we had with him. There's some fascinating things you're saying about uh, Robert H. Jackson here that I would like to pursue with you at another time because uh, uh, the balance, uh, again, Jamestown jurisprudence and this extraordinary mechanism, machinery of Nuremberg that he had to uh, orchestrate and run and to be able to successfully do that in the pragmatic fashion that you're talking about and not get to use the contemporary vernacular lost in the weeds at the same time. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a very interesting, uh, provocative kind of balance to think about that uh, Jackson executed, uh, must have executed at that. But I want to come back now in the final minutes that we have in our second hour, Greg Peterson, to you. And at these moments, and they were quite explosive in terms of your being able to tap the resources, living resources available, who could connect you to the life and work of Robert H. Jackson. How was it for you then to be a part of this center and work with a board of directors and maintain a law practice of your own at the same time? It sounds like a sort of dizzying time in the life of you. All of that is true. Uh, and. Uh, and at the same time, you know, we have, I have three children with, with my wife, and uh, Cindy was, of course, a, 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 a grounding and a balancing act of all, and I had a very uh, supportive law firm. I mentioned that at the, at the outset here, which permitted me to do this. And, of course, this is a team. This is a team. And, I, and I, one of the things about this community is their willingness to be engaged uh, Perhaps you know, once you excite them in the possibilities, they're willing to involve themselves, involve their time, involve their energies. So whether it was board members, whether it was foundations, a number of them, many of them I haven't mentioned, all incredibly supportive and all behind that are personalities. A foundation is not a corporate entity. It's individuals who make that up. So those relationships all kind of came together. It dovetailed a little bit into my practice of law, perhaps. And this is a law, Jackson was a lawyer and a judge, and you got to be able to meld practice, people, personalities that you're now interfacing with a common cause of advancing uh, a Jamestown resident, uh, area native, who did incredibly well, and always with an eye towards, I didn't know that, Wow, there's a wow factor. But in your pragmatic management of all that you had taken on, what I don't hear you saying was that there was ever a moment in which you said, wow, what have I gotten myself into here? <laughs> or, or I don't hear you saying, oh, I, I, I'm so overwhelmed, I, I don't know that I can finish this work. You were still, had your head above water. I think that's true. Um, we never, to this day, uh, hit a brick wall. You know, I think you asked at the outset, could you have envisioned what, it, what we are today, 20 years ago? And the answer is absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. And so you just kind of went forward, forward. Yeah, you had to make course corrections. But along the way, you're in meeting some incredibly interesting people. And whoever I'm meeting in the public eye, you got to st I have a story to tell about Jackson. By the way, did you know? Well, the next thing, you don't know where that conversation's going to go. You know, whether, I, it's so many, so many opportunities of people where all of a sudden a sudden conversation say, hey, meet Aunt Tilly, who was at the Nuremberg trial, and next thing you know, Aunt Tilly's being at the here, and I'm interviewing her. Uh, that keeps the juices going, and to this day it does. <laughs> so, uh, so many people who were very supportive, my family, my parents, 
my, my, certainly my wife, the kids. My kids, got, I've engaged them. Uh, and so many people, like I'm looking at Ed Tomasini over there, who's just been with us for 20-some years. I think he's still got a smile on his face. Um, all of that permits you to wake up in the morning and saying, what's today going to bring? Uh, and, and I never really look back. You know, sure, you've got history, you're building up history, and you're building up a vault. And that's why I'm delighted, Dennis Webster, that you're causing me <laughs> to reflect on the times which, yeah, some books have been written about it all, but it's for, we're looking forward. Now I am looking back, and you can start seeing some um, rational approach towards why we got to where we got to. And, uh, but it, it's certainly, I've been, I've been blessed. We, we, had a, we had an event on our 10th anniversary, and we invited everybody. And there's mm -hmm. a booklet that we were involved. And it's pages, just pages of people in the community uh, who were engaged, volunteers, docents, drivers, you know, all of this stuff, and it took a whole lot of people doing that stuff uh, to do that. So, yeah, we've been, we've been very lucky at the Jackson Center. Our second hour is finished, Greg, and I would encourage those people who are perhaps viewing this video archive in order to join us for the third hour, because we will talk about the Chief Justice of the United States coming to the Robert H. Jackson Center. Before we do that, though, we might talk about some pictures that were taken at Nuremberg and surround us in the room here at the Kappa Theater before we get to uh, William Rehnquist. But thank you once again for the opportunity to conduct these interviews with you, and thank you to those who are viewing this. Well, uh, as we draw closure, we are again at the Kappa Theater, and I'm, I'm looking around. Uh, there are pictures, uh, some mostly black and white, some in color, uh, taken by Ray D'Addario. Let's hold him till next time. We're going to hold it? Okay, we're teasing him. All right. Right now, I need to say thank you to Kristen <laughs> McMahon, the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center, the entire staff here for the opportunity to use this wonderful facility to record these interviews. As you mentioned, all the technical work is done by Ed Tomasini himself, a committed supporter of the work of the Robert H. Jackson Center. We speak to you on February 10th, 2021, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you look at the set here at the Kappa Theater, you will see that appropriate protocols have put in, been put in place, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Guy's good. The guy's good. He's, he's getting stuff out of me, man. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, uh, I